baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Acts chapter 10 and how I am enjoying myself at the old campgrounds in the Texaco district you all have been so kind and have uh, made very kind expressions to me and thank you for your kindness thank you most of all for your love for the Lord your attention to the Word of God and I want to give you a teaching today that has impacted and I could even say has changed my life it's changed how I pray and I was thinking about brother Dylan's great message last night on our prayers being touched by the fire of God and what I'm going to share with you today can be used every day you can use it every day and uh, there are aspects to what I'm going to share with you that involve spiritual warfare there are aspects that what I'm going to share with you today just involve kingdom praying but I want to I want to use for a text Peter's message the Apostle Peter's message to the household of Cornelius and it was supernatural that Peter and his entourage came to Cornelius's house. If, you, if you're a Bible student, you know that Cornelius was praying. In fact, Brother Dylan mentioned that Cornelius' prayer had come up as a memorial before God. And, uh, and so uh, Cornelius sent two men down exactly to where Peter was staying as directed by the Holy Ghost. And those men came back, and Peter is preaching a breakthrough message. This was the first Gentiles that received the Holy Ghost. And I want to pick up his message at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth. Would you say those five words with me? Then Peter opened his mouth. He opened his mouth and said of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. How many believes that God has a people from every nation? He has a people from every nation. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. Notice verse 37. That word I say, that word I say, Peter opened his mouth and he said, that word I say, that God's going to have a people from every nation, that God is no respecter of persons. What Peter was preaching, what he was saying was getting ready to happen. What he was speaking was actually prophetic. He was prophesying. And speaking into Cornelius and to his house what was getting ready to happen. He said, that word I say, verse 37, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, and God was with him. And he continued on hearing his message to preach Christ verse 40 God raised him up on the third day he preached the gospel and then notice verse 43 
To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now notice especially verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. While Peter was opening his mouth, while he was speaking, the thing that he was speaking into them happened right in the middle of his message. And I don't think Peter said, now wait a minute, God, I had a really good sermon going here. I had four more good points. <laughs> oh, no. While he was speaking, when he opened his mouth, the thing that he was talking about, the thing that had been prophesied about, and the thing that God had already assured him was going to happen, happened. And this teaching I want to give you today, I'm just going to entitle it, Speak Until Something Happens. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, it's time for you to open your mouth and keep talking until something happens. Praise God. Everybody can be seated. Everybody having a good time? Everybody enjoying camp meeting 2006? Hasn't God been good to us? Amen. I've been encouraged. I've heard from God. The Lord has spoke to my heart through Brother Dylan's preaching and others that have ministered. And I thank God for it. Now, I want to talk to you today about speaking supernaturally. I saw a couple eyebrows go up. Speaking supernaturally? Me? Speak supernaturally? Yeah. I'm going to stay right in that black book for the next 30 minutes. All right? The spirit-filled child of God has the God-given power and authority to speak supernaturally. Amen. About four people believe that. Amen. You have the power, permission, and authority to speak supernaturally. You can't even get saved without opening your mouth and speaking. Amen. Hebrew, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. You just can't believe in your heart. You've got to confess it with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead. You shall be saved. Now, this isn't my message, but let me just handle that for people that believe that all you have to do is say, I love Jesus and accept him in my heart. And I'm saying, that's not the context of that verse. It's not the biblical context, and it's not the historical context. The hist you know, people that talk about the Roman road to salvation, there is no such thing as a Roman road to salvation. Because Paul is the writer of Romans, and Paul didn't get saved on the road to Rome. He got saved on the road to Damascus. If you want to know how to get saved, get on the right road. Get to the road to Damascus. Then you'll find out how to get saved. But let me just handle this verse right here. The historical context of confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Friend, that is historically, that's what was said by the candidates when they were baptized. In Jesus' name. You compare that with Acts 22, 16. Why tarriest thou but arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins? Doing what? Calling on the name of the Lord. I don't know how you do it in your church, but in our church, when we baptize people, we always, 
The baptizer always says, and I'll baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what we say over those. But we have the people themselves that are being baptized. We have them raise their hand and say, I call on the name of the Lord Jesus to come and wash away my sins. Friend, that's powerful. That's powerful. Heaven sits up and takes notice when a believer opens their mouth to the Lord and they say, I'm calling on Jesus, the only saving name. Neither is there salvation in any other name, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so when Paul said, you will be saved if you confess and open your mouth. In the waters of baptism, that's a powerful thing. It creates a transaction in heaven when a believer opens their mouth and says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God raised him from the dead. Does any believe, anybody believe that in the house today? Have you ever confessed that? Have you ever spoken that? Have you ever opened your mouth? If you have, you're speaking supernaturally. Is this book a supernatural book? Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is a supernatural book. And in fact, I can't add anything to what Brother Dylan gave us last night. But if you want to pray something powerful, pray this. Is that all right? Amen. Pray the scripture. It's already anointed. And you speak it unto God, and a transaction occurs in your heart. Amen. You're speaking unto the Lord, and God honors His word. It's already anointed. It's already prophetic. It's already going to come to pass. We have the power to speak supernaturally. In fact, God has given us the gifts of the Spirit. Word of wisdom, knowledge, faith, tongues, interpretation of tongues, discernment of spirit, and on and on. The Bible says that God has given the spirit of prophecy and the ability to speak in an unknown language. How many understand that when we speak with tongues, we are speaking supernaturally? Am I in a Pentecostal camp meeting? Am I in an apostolic context? We believe that. We believe that. And the reason it happens in our churches is because we preach it. And you get what you preach. Praise God. God has given us, through the gifts of the Spirit, the ability to speak supernaturally. We don't think anything about it. We're in an apostolic service. Some message in tongues. A holy hush comes. The message in tongues. That person speaking supernaturally. The interpretation comes. That person is speaking supernaturally, right? Amen. They're, they're the oracle of God. God speaks through them. How God ministers to us. I, I get nervous when I'm in an apostolic service and the Holy Ghost is not moving. And the gifts of the Spirit are not operating. The fruit of the Spirit is not manifest. It makes me nervous. Thank God I had been nervous one time at Texaco camp meeting. Hallelujah. Because the Spirit of God is moving. You see, God has empowered His people to speak. To open our mouths. And to speak supernaturally. The words that you speak are powerful. Do you remember when we were kids and someone called us a bad name and we said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never harm me. You know, that's really not true. If, 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 if I polled everybody here today, we can all remember mean things, nasty things, cutting things, hurting things. It happened in an instant. 
It happened in a moment of time. The person that spoke it never gave it another thought, but it stuck in your crawl. Words are powerful. That's why David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God. The Bible says that life and death are in the power of what? The tongue. Your tongue has power to create life or death by how you speak. If, if I spoke into my son, I have two sons. I've got Justin's 23 and Caleb's 8. Let's take the 8-year-old. He's red-headed. He's handsome. He's had one whipping in his life. That's all it took. He's autopilot kid. He's as precious as they come. And I know I'm prejudiced. But if I took him aside and every day I said, you're a loser. You're not going to amount to anything. Look, you made your bed, but it, it, it's no good. You didn't do a good job. If I just constantly tore him down and spoke negativity into him, what, how would it impact his life? It would, make, it would give him a defeated mentality that he could never succeed. That would either turn him into a workaholic or it would make him passive because of the words that I speak into him. How many are thankful that your heavenly father speaks into you words of life and words of courage, encouragement and words of strength? The way that our heavenly father talks to us is the way that we need to talk to one another. Words are powerful. I want, I want you to ask yourself a question. I want to talk to you about how you talk to yourself. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. God could help us a whole lot better if some of us would start helping ourselves. Amen. You know, I like to play golf every once in a while. I'm sorry if you preach against it. I don't. The golf course, as far as I'm concerned, is holy ground. 18 holy ground. Amen. I don't mean to make it so spiritual, but I have won at least one soul off the golf course. Baptized and filled, gotten filled with the Holy Ghost and the leader in our church. So it's sanctified. Hallelujah. But what if I went out and, uh, come here, sir. Come here. I said, look, uh, would you like to earn a little extra cash today? $5. And what I want you to do is follow me around everywhere. And, uh, okay, stand right back here. I'm going to hit the ball this way. And uh, if, if I make a bad shot, I want you to call me an idiot. All right? Ready? Brother Elms, don't check out my swing. The ball shanks off into the woods. Go ahead. You're an idiot. Now, you know what? I tell myself that a whole lot when I'm on the golf course. Oh, that was stupid. Have you ever played this game before? You've been playing this game for 24 years, and you've done the same stupid thing you've ever done. You've done that a million times. When are you ever going to get it together? Now, I tell myself that, but would I pay somebody to follow me around the golf course? And call me stupid every time I made a bad shot? No, I wouldn't do that. Thank you, sir. Let's give him a hand. He did exactly what I told him to do. But he didn't say it with venom in his spirit. He was being obedient. What if the words you spoke about yourself in your mind, what if they went up into the heavens like a vapor? and then rain down upon you like a garment, how would you be dressed today? Would you be dressed like a king and a queen, or would you be dressed like a peasant? 
Someone said a negative word, a critical word, is like a prayer to hell. And I've come to speak into apostolic people today and tell you, God don't make junk. Don't you give the devil an upper hand in your spirit and say, I'm a loser. I failed again. I'm never going to make it. I'm a jerk. Uh, I disappointed God. Uh, uh, my kids are never coming back to God. Uh, I'm never going to be blessed. Uh, I've got this curse on me. I'm never going to succeed. I'm never going to be nothing from God, friend. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You have been sanctified. You have been washed. You have been cleansed. You have been changed. You are a child of God. You are a king's kid. You have a powerful destiny. You are going to be something awesome. You have an incredible future. I'm going to tell you what I do. I go to places. I go to conferences and camps and places. I want to hear from God. I want God to speak to me. I, I, I can't say that I actually go get in line and seek it out, but I love it when someone speaks prophetically to me. Is that okay? Anybody else love that? Somebody speaks prophetically over you? Oh, hallelujah, friend. When a, when a door of utterance opens, when a prophetic word comes, I hang on to it. I pray over it. You see, the promises of God are nothing to us. God can speak, but we've got to put them into action. We've got to pray it into fruition. We can't just say, well, God spoke. It's going to happen. Oh, no, friend. Israel wandered in the wilderness 40 years, and some of them never went in. Even though they had a promise from God, they never spoke it. They never actualized it. They never opened their mouth. They murmured. They complained, and they talked their way out of the promise of God. I love it when God speaks to me prophetically. But you know what? If I need something prophetically spoken into my spirit and there's nobody there to do it, I prophesy to myself. Praise God. Here's how it works. The devil says, you're a loser. And I say... Devil, you're a liar. See, he's a liar and the father of all lies. And whatever he tells you, you can bank on the opposite being true. If he says you're a loser, you say to yourself, I'm a winner. If he says you're not going to make it, you say, oh, yeah, I am going to make it. Hallelujah. Amen. If he says uh, you're not going to be blessed, you can believe the opposite. You can just get ready, friend. As far down as he tries to take you, God's going to take you that much higher. Amen. If somebody won't prophesy to you, then prophesy to yourself. Am I all right, Elder Pew? Praise God. If I can't get a word from God from somewhere, I'm going to get out the word of God. I'm going to get out something like Deuteronomy 28. And I'm going to say, I'm not the tail. I am the head. I'm not going to be under it. I'm going to get over it. I shall lend and not borrow. When my enemy comes in from one direction, I'm going to send him out in seven directions. Somebody needs to rise up and start speaking supernaturally and prophesy. Friend, this is very practical. This is very practical. You say, well, this is for the super holy people. And, oh, no. Friend, one word out of your mouth can turn your world upside down. Praise God. Praise God. I think somebody needs to prophesy to yourself today. I'm not going to go bankrupt. I'm going to be blessed. Praise God. I'm not going to be tormented by that spirit. I send that spirit out of my mind. I send it out of my children's bedroom. I send it out of my automobile. That's not going to happen. Praise God. We have the power to open our mouth and speak with authority. Praise God. 
Let me talk to you from the scriptures here today. Jesus gave us a teaching in Mark chapter 11. And I want you to turn there. This is when he came to the fig tree and it was not bearing fruit. And Jesus cursed it and nothing happened until they came back the next day. And when they came back the next day, verse 20 of Mark 11, they saw that the fig tree had dried up from the roots. And Peter called into remembrance, said to him, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus answered him and said, Have faith in God. Say those four words with me. Have faith in God. Jesus did not say, Have faith in your faith. He did not say, Have faith in your method. He said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. You see, sometimes when something works spiritually, when something works supernaturally, we tend to think that that's the way it's always going to work. That's the way it's always going to be. But I want to tell you, Moses talked to a burning bush one time, but he never went looking for that bush again. Why? Because God had moved on. It was just for the moment. He didn't have faith in the burning bush. He said, well, I can't hear from God unless I find another bush that's burning. No. Oh, yeah. Have faith in God. The disciples one day tried to cast a devil out of a boy. And they couldn't do it. And that's amazing because they had cast devils out before. And they came to Jesus and said, why could we not cast the devil out of this boy? And Jesus said, this kind, this kind. He differentiated between what they had met before and what they were facing today. He said, this kind cometh not out, but by prayer and fasting. You've got to go to a new level. Because Brother Tenney said, at every new level, there's a new devil. And so, this kind cometh not out, but by prayer and fasting. You see, the disciples had attached their faith to a method. They had attached their faith to a pedigree and to a history. And Jesus said, you cannot attach your faith to a method. You've got to have faith in God. Well, let's see, how did we cast all those other devils out? I think we had our left, no, I think it was the right foot forward. And then, no, I think it was right foot forward and then left hand. Jesus said, forget that. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. You see, this isn't my message today, but we're living in a this kind of a world. I said we're living in a this kind of a world. This kind cometh not out, but by prayer and fasting. What would happen to the Texaco district if we could go to a new level in fasting and in prayer and in speaking faith and opening our mouths and seeing God change the realities in the environment around us. I'm telling you, friend, there's power when the child of God opens their mouth. And Jesus went on to say, he said, you think that's a big thing? Let me tell you something. He looked and he said, right there. If you have faith, you can speak to that mountain and say, be thou removed and cast into the sea. Did Jesus say that? Did, did he say to speak to the mountain? Is that what he said? Now, 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 I want you to get this. This is the principle. Did he say, go into your prayer room for 30 days and bury your head in the carpet and pray about the mountain. Is that what he said? No. He said, you go stare that mountain down. You go look at it. Look at its timberline. Look at its snow peak, whatever. However tall it is. You speak to that mountain. And you know what? Sometimes we pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and there has to come a time when we put legs on those prayers we put action into those prayers we put activity into that faith and we stop talking to God about our problem and we start talking to our problem about our God Moses could have 
prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and threw the rod down and put his hand in his coat and pulled it out. Said, man, that's the coolest thing. Watch this. But he had to put it on location. He had to go stare Pharaoh down and he had to say, let my people go. To put it on location. Um, I, I'm ruining a good sermon today because I got a lot of things coming to me here today. But let me. Everybody just say, help him, Jesus. He's helping me. He's helping me. Listen. Jesus said to speak to the mountain. Paul said to every man is given. The measure of faith. And then he said, faith comes by You can't hear unless somebody's speaking. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of Jesus likened faith to a seed. He said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed. I just imagine in my mind that if every man has been given the measure of faith, and if it's true that without faith we cannot please God, and if God does want us to please Him, then God has deposited in the soil of our soul every seed of faith we're going to need to come against every challenge, every situation, and every opportunity to please God. There are seeds of faith that God has planted just barely under the soil of our soul. A few years ago, I, uh, I went to uh, an exhibit of King Tut's tomb. Has anybody seen that stuff? It's amazing. I think it was in Chicago years ago, and they took another tour here recently. And I read a little excerpt, and they said that they found in his 3,000-year-old tomb three kernels of corn. And they took those kernels of corn that were 3,000 years old, and they planted them in the ground and guess what happened corn grew 3,000 years old they went underneath the soil of Jesus said except the corn of wheat fall on the ground and die it abideth alone and he's teaching us the principle that he has placed under the soil of our soul seeds of faith it doesn't matter how long they've been there but you cannot do anything to please God without faith and the good news is he's given you a seed of faith for every moment in your life that you need to please God that you need to go to a new level that you need to believe him for a miracle that you need to believe him to answer a prayer it's already there let me tell you how it works when I was eight years old I was eight years old at Midway Tabernacle in St. Paul, Minnesota. My pastor, S.G. Norris, he preached a Sunday night message. And my favorite moment when he preached was when he closed the Bible. Because then I knew it wouldn't be long we could get out of there. But when he closed his Bible that night, whew, something smote my spirit. And my eight-year-old sin-sick soul made its way over here to the left side of the altar. And I raised my hands and I asked God to forgive me of my sins. You say, well, what kind of a sins did an eight-year-old have? Friend, I felt like the nastiest, low, lowest down scallywag that the world had ever known. I was convicted of my sin and God had placed a seed of faith that said repentance of sins for the first time. And it cracked open when I heard the word of God. And God gave me faith to believe that if I can my sins he would be faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness and about a year later there was another seed that said uh, water baptism in Jesus name and I heard another message and the seed cracked open and I said I've got to be baptized and it wasn't a few months later there was another seed that said receive ye the Holy Ghost and I heard another word of God and the seed cracked open and God filled me with the Holy Ghost and what I'm trying to share with you today is that no matter where you are, no matter how tough it is, no matter what the challenge in your life, God has already put the seed of faith in your spirit. That's why you come to camp meeting, to hear the word of God. 
That's why we go to church and we submit ourselves to the word of God. That's why we have evangelists like Jerry Dillon come and preach uh, because things happen when the preaching of the word is going forth. Something happened when Peter was speaking. The Holy Ghost fell. We believe that the supernatural happens uh, when we get together in church uh, and things start happening when we open our mouths unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody is in a challenge in a battle of your life. You haven't heard the word from God yet that you want to hear. But I want to tell you, friend, uh, there's healing power when the word of God goes out. There's delivering power when the word of God goes out. Uh, amen. There's, uh, there's prophetic power when the word of God goes out. Any man who's a man of God knows what it's like when an unction comes upon him. And he knows that his preaching goes to a new level. And he steps into a dimension of prophecy. Oh, friend, I want you to know there's supernatural power in the house of God today. Somebody over Open your mouth to the Lord and begin to prophesy the thing that you want to come to pass in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's right. Come on. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Let's just clap our hands to the Lord. Let faith rise. Let faith rise. Oh. Oh. Hallelujah. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to survive. I tell you, you're going to make it by the word of God. Let the seed of faith crack open in your spirit. You're going to make it. It's going to be different when you go home. God's taking care of it right now. He's moving in your behalf. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Say, Brother Gleason, are you saying that I can open my mouth and create? No, only God can do that. Only God can do that. You can be seated. You see, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved. Everybody say, God moved. God moved. Oh, I thank God for the Holy Ghost when it begins to move. Hallelujah. That, that word move means to hover, to flutter. And the word picture is like a mother bird on the nest. The Spirit of God moved. Everybody say, God moved. The Spirit of God was hovering. It was fluttering. It, it was like a, almost when you see a helicopter come down and the d dirt gets stirred up or the, the water gets stirred up if it's maybe doing a rescue in, this, in the sea and it gets all stirred up. That's what was happening. The Holy Ghost was moving. The Spirit of God was moving on the face of the waters. I was cutting the grass a few months ago and... and uh, Say, you cut your grass? Yeah. I cut mine and my mother-in-law's across the street. It's the only exercise I get anymore. I do some of my best thinking while I'm cutting the grass. So just get over it. So my wife said, now, honey, there's a mother robin on the nest in the cedar tree. She's very protective. You better be careful. I said, no problem. I forgot all about the mother robin to my chagrin and I was cutting the grass making sure all my rows were straight going back and forth I was doing some deep thinking I forgot all about her until I heard this hideous sound like <laughs> and I looked out of the corner of my eye and I saw the white of her eyes I was about this far from her and she said you better back off bad boy or I'm gonna nail you right now it was too late. She come flying out of that nest. She started doing the kamikaze bomb on my head. And I'm going like this. And if one of my kids would have been looking outside right then, they'd have said, look, Mom, Dad's getting the Holy Ghost all over again. But that mother bird protects that expectation of life. Its conception has happened. 
Gestation is taking place and she's hovering, she's fluttering and the promise of fruition and the promise of life is there and she stays there even at her own peril and danger. The Spirit of God was hovering what was happening. The Spirit of God was impregnating creation. The Spirit of God was bringing to gestation creation and getting things ready. But I want you to notice that nothing happened in creation until God said. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And friends, this is the message today. There's things that we all want to see happen. There are promises of God that we are believing God for. There are things God promised me when I was 19 years old that I haven't yet seen come to pass completely in my ministry. But I've been praying over it. I've been brooding over it. I've been fluttering over it. I've been hovering over it. I've been sending out the Holy Ghost over it. But friend, there's going to come a day that I'm going to rise up and I'm going to speak the thing that I want to see take place in my life. Oh, hallelujah. I I practice what I'm preaching. I practice it. I told you that our church has been homeless. And and we've been wandering in different tents like Abraham did for six years. And we're about six weeks away from getting in our new building. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, we were leasing from a particular church. The pastor resigned five weeks after he welcomed us in. And uh, we were there for about 60 Sundays. And the board of directors called us in and said, look, we got a new pastor now. We want you out in 30 days. Have a nice day. We had been negotiating to get into another church that had been vacated. And they had told us, green light all the way. You can come in here. On the, the next day, that first thing was on a Monday night. On Tuesday, the next day, that church called and said, you can't come here. And I'm thinking, oh, God. I really am going to have a homeless church. We're going to be meeting under the old shade tree. I had went to another church of another denomination, and I confronted that pastor, and I asked him if he would consider us coming into their church. He took it to his board, and one of his board members said, Oh, no, we don't want that bunch in here. We've dealt with that group before, not our church, but another place. We've dealt with them before. We don't want them in our church. And I didn't take that for an answer. And I began to seek God and had our leaders seek God, and and we just believed that God would have an open door for us. I got up on a Sunday right when all this was going on, and I I preached a message I entitled Three Days to a Breakthrough. And I talked about how the children of Israel came out of Egypt and it was a three-day journey to the Red Sea. And then God performed a great miracle and Moses stretched out the rod. And when they were between the devil and the deep blue sea, God made a path for them. And I had me a, a staff up there like Moses' staff. And I said, you know what, church? The way I see it, there's only one place for us to go. And it's the church that said we can't come in. But I want the spirit of prophecy to rise up in this this church as I preach three days to a breakthrough and I'm going to stretch my hand out I want you to turn around and face that church and say by the grace of God by the authority of the word we are coming in that was on a Sunday and guess what on Monday I get a phone call Stan this is Pastor Jason you're not going to believe this in fact, i gotta t- I got to insert this. The Lord had spoke to me and said, I'm going to take the no out of his mouth, and I'm going to put a yes in his mouth. And I started confessing it. I started confessing. In fact, I took a prayer drive around that church, and I said, we're coming in. And I said, God, you've taken the no out of his mouth. You're going to put a yes in his mouth. And the pastor said, you're not going to believe this. The guy that said, we don't want to have anything to do with him, he said, I think we ought to give him a chance. We ought to let him come in. And we've been worshiping there for three years while we've been building our building and relocating. Old friend, when you want to see something come to pass, you need to step out on faith and you need to take authority and speak to the mountain and speak to the thing that you want to see change. I believe what I'm preaching to you. In fact, one Sunday after church, there was a woman in our church. Her and her husband were riding home. They were on a four-lane busy road. And uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she said, stop that car. He slammed on his brakes, 
pulled over. He said, what's wrong? She said, I'll be back in a minute. She got out. She slammed the door. She walked across four lanes of busy traffic over to a gentleman's club. Before she was converted, she was a dancer in a gentleman's club. And it just vexed her spirit that day. She had just come from church. She had driven by there many times. But today, it was different. She said, stop the car. She walked out of the car. Cars were slamming on their brakes. She walked across. She marched seven times around that gentleman's club. She said, you have destroyed the last marriage you're going to destroy. You have corrupted the last mind that you're going to corrupt. You have seduced the last man you're going to seduce. I take authority over the spirit that I used to be under. And in Jesus' name, I command this building to shut down. She didn't just go to the prayer room and talk to God about it. She came out to the problem and started talking to her problem about her God. Say, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. In two weeks, it shut down. I said, in two weeks, the business shut down. Don't tell me there's not power when a spirit-filled child of God rises up and speaks to the thing that they want to see changed. I heard Brother Phil Tolstead, our great missionary to Malawi, recently told a story about a woman. He said the Malawian people love to pray. And this elderly woman loved to pray. And, but her problem was she could pray with victory at church, but she could not pray with victory at home. And it was very difficult for her to commute to church. It was all the way across town. She couldn't drive. It was a problem. So one day she's praying and she's asking the Lord. She said, God... Why can I pray at vic with victory at church and I cannot pray with victory at my house? And the Lord revealed to her that there were eight witch doctors that lived in circumference in proximity to her house. So she did a little research and she found out where they lived. And she went up to each house and knocked on the door and introduced herself to those witch doctors. And said, my name is Sister So-and-so. I attend United Pentecostal Church. I love to pray, but uh, I pray in victory at my church, and I can't pray in victory at home. And I got to asking the Lord why I couldn't, and the Lord told me that you are my problem. She said, so I'm giving you three choices. Don't you love it? This little old scrawny, wrinkled-up lady. I'm giving you three choices. You can either fall down and repent of your sins or you can move or God that I serve is going to kill you. Have a nice day. In two months, four of them died, two of them moved off, and two of them repented of their sins and were baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And she's praying in victory. She's praying with victory at her house. Oh, friend, it's powerful when you open your mouth and speak the thing. The Bible said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That actually means a legal contract. It means it's a done deal. When you operate in faith and in God's faith and you know in your heart it's going to happen, you have authority to speak it and act like it's already taken place. Some of you know the name Ballestero. Brother Carl Ballestero and his wife, Content Ballestero, she's my aunt, she's my dad's sister. Brother Ballesteros passed away now, but years ago when he was in the military, they were married and expecting their first child. She was at home, and he was overseas or somewhere, stationed somewhere. I don't know where it was, but it was a long ways away. And, and her parents were 1,500 miles away. I think they were living in Louisiana at the time. Her parents were in Oregon. She didn't have anybody. She didn't know who to call on. And she was expecting this child. She hadn't had a good meal in a couple of days. And she said, oh, Jesus, I'm so hungry. I, I would just love to have a roast beef dinner with mashed potatoes and gravy 
and rolls, hot rolls with butter and green beans and iced tea. And she was just spelling out what she was hungry for. I just asked her when I saw her about three weeks ago on a family vacation and a reunion we had. She said it was 10 minutes. 10 minutes later, there was a knock on the door. The neighbor lady said, uh, Connie, we just had a nice meal and we had a little bit left over. Thought you might enjoy it. We know Carl's gone. And she said, what is it? She said, it's roast beef, mashed potatoes and gravy, green beans, butter with roll, roll with butter. Hallelujah. And iced tea. Oh, don't tell me. You can't open your mouth and speak the thing in your heavenly father will answer your prayer Woo! I'm talking to you about speaking supernaturally oh I could go on and on and on some of you have heard of Eli Hernandez the evangelist he told me that there was, a, there was a pastor in Mexico, a very poor family, and had, had a bunch of kids four or five kids, and they hadn't had a decent meal in about three days and so the father said to the children, children, set the table. We're going to have dinner tonight. They'd already looked in the refrigerator 20 times that day. They'd been to the cupboard 50 times. There's no food in the house. Dad, what do you mean? Just set the table. So the kids set the table. Sit down. They sat down. He said, all right, now let's join hands and we're going to pray. And so he starts praying. He said, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this meal that we're about to receive. And the kids are looking at each other thinking, Dad is nuts. It was a hot summer night. The windows were open when they said, in Jesus' name, amen. A chicken flew in the window. You never saw such pandemonium. Somebody got a hold of the chicken and rang its neck and they plucked the feathers and they put it in a pot and they had dinner that night. I know it's hot and I know it's afternoon, but I'm telling you a truth. I'm telling you a truth. It's time for you to start opening your mouth. It's time for you to put your prayer on location. I preached a similar message to this a couple of weeks ago at Wisconsin camp and a pastor who couldn't be there but his saints were there. He called me. He said, I don't know what you told our people, but our people are speaking. They're opening their mouth. He said one woman went to her boss and spoke a raise into her boss and the boss gave her a raise. Hallelujah. He said another woman needed a house to live in. It was the house that she wanted and she took a walk around it seven times and she said they not only got the house, they got it at a reduced cost. Friend, there's something happens when the child of God opens her mouth by faith. You don't have to sit there and take it. You don't have to wait for a rainy day. It's time to open your mouth to the Lord. I want you to stand with me. We have a, had a woman in our church. They've since moved to Seattle about six months ago. Her name is Dana Gorm. She, uh, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she had all kinds of chemo and radiation. And it was doing very little for her. And one Sunday, she said, she rose up publicly in the church. She said, Pastor, I'm going for an examination this week. She said, I'm coming next Sunday with medical documents that my body is healed. Now, friend, that's some faith talking. I'm coming next Sunday. I'm going to have proof. I'm not just going to feel good. I'm going to have the medical proof. Friend, you know what happened. Next Sunday, she came in dancing, waving the documentation. They ran my blood test again. They said, there's no cancer in my blood. There's no cancer in my body. You say, it would have happened anyway. I don't know, friend. She stood up and she spoke the thing that she wanted to see take place. We got to hold of something powerful. I said, we got to hold of something powerful. I'm going to give you a, radi a real radical one right now. I have a friend who's a great apostle to India. And he has seen thousands of people receive the Holy Ghost. 
His name is C.P. Thomas. Bringing wet, he's about 140 pounds, little Asian Indian man. But he's so full of the Holy Ghost. He's been beaten three times for the gospel's sake, twice by Muslims, once by Hindus. The last time he was beaten, they pulled his scalp away from his skull. Oh, Jesus. They beat him with metal rods and kicked him until blood started coming out of his nose, his ears, his eyes, and his mouth. They locked him in a garage, and he could hear them talking. They said, we're going to come back in a couple hours, and we'll kill him. A few minutes, he heard the key in the lock, and the lock rattled, and he could hear the lock fall, and the door kind of swung open. Whoever unlocked the door, he doesn't know who unlocked it, but he slipped out in the cover of night and drug his way to a hospital in that city in northern India. The doctors examined him and said, you are going to need emergency surgery. Your body is dying. And he was afraid to have surgery because in India, if they put you out and they open you out up, they could take a, a kidney or a vital organ and sell it for thousands of dollars on the black market. And he was a very concerned about that. So that night he gathered his clothes together and he slipped out of the hospital. And he somehow made his way down to the train station and, and he began a three-day journey home. Now, I don't know what you think about this, but I know what I think about it. He said, Brother Gleason, I pointed to my body. I said, you no die. You no die. You are temple of Holy Ghost. You no die. Oh, Jesus. You serve Jesus. You preach gospel to the Hindus and to the heathens and to the Muslims. You no die. I speak to you. You no die in Jesus' name. When he got home three days later, the blood stopped coming out of his eyes, his ears, his mouth, and his nose. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. He's still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, friend, there's power when you open your mouth and you prophesy and speak the thing that you want to see come to pass. I know I preach too long, but I want you to come and stand with me around this altar for a moment. Some of us have been talking to our problem, to our God about our problem, and it's time for some of us to start talking to our problem about our God. And when you come up here today, I don't want you to pray. I want you to speak. Don't pray. I know it's difficult. I know it's strange. I know it's odd. I want you to speak. If it's a disease, speak to it. If it's a relationship, talk to it. If it's a mountain, talk to it. Come on, I want you to close your eyes. Lift your hands to the Lord. And go ahead and prophesy.
Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful. Echoes, echoes, echoes of eternity.